Hey everybody, welcome back to for today. It's Saturday. We're going to touch on a couple of cool items that you may have missed this week. I know we've been very much obsessed with all things the Bitcoin having, etc. But there's some other stuff that actually went down too that we will cover off on and also help us prepare ourselves for next week. So first of all, uh, some fun things happening in the Twitterverse. Uh, what else? Bullish case for Bitcoin amongst the uh, crazy rising debt. I'll show you a new perspective of a debt calculation that will blow your mind. Uh, Mark Yusko versus Peter Schiff talking Bitcoin and gold. Million dollar bet. Let's do it. Uh, U.S. deficit crazy stats. Also, there's a lot of people saying, you know, say, Sui, all these S tokens that are supposed to be sol killers. We'll look at some data there. We'll do a little mini face off. And we'll talk about DeFi Summer 2.0 and Uniswap and how <laughs> the best car in the world is under 30,000 and it drives itself. Madness to even consider. And NVIDIA takes a bit of a dump too. Now we'll talk about the earnings ahead next week. So let's jump in. None of this is, of course, financial advice. And a big shout out to everybody on Patreon too. And thank you for to TND Tesla being here as a moderator. Let's look at the week behind, last seven days. And you can see everything divided by Bitcoin. A couple of things actually did outperform Bitcoin. Ethereum, Solana, Cardano, Avalanche, ICP, Near, Doge, LA token, which I didn't even hear of before. When we look at the actual price in dollar terms, Bitcoin just over 65K, down 3.89% for the week. ETH down 3.39%. Sol down about 2%, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Not a, you know, it was, there was so much anxiety, you know, looking into the actual halving that people didn't know what to do. So a lot of people stayed at home rather than invest in the markets. And we saw that with volumes as well. Anyway, we're back. I think next week will be very good. I think this weekend will be solid as well. Let's go. And again, by the way, I'm just, when I do this, I do this based on data. And the data that I use is right about 80% of the time. But 20% of the time, it's not right. So bear that in mind as well. So let's talk about this, where we are in the Bitcoin cycle. I should have used this in this morning's Bitcoin video. But just to show you, we are here. We have a long way to go, ladies and gentlemen. And I never get tired of looking at these cycle charts. Let me see. Green is the 2018 to 2022 cycle, the last one. Blue is 2015 to 2018, red is 2011 to 2015, and yellow, well, nobody is around really for yellow, except for the gurus, so you can discount that. But the point is, we are going up from here. <laughs> There's no ifs, ands, or buts. We are going up from here. Now, uh, this was super interesting too. It's on Fortune magazine. This guy is all over the place. His name is Peter Schiff. I just found out that actually his nephew is Pomp. <laughs> Yeah, I believe that there. But he is urging Bitcoin investors to sell. Sell their Bitcoin and buy gold. He sells gold. And with the commissions he makes in selling gold, he buys emerging market uh, stock stocks. Emerging market stocks. He doesn't even buy gold himself, but he shills it. So shout out to Mark Yusko, who comes out and literally throws down the gauntlet. Peter, we are so sick of your BS. Time for money where your mouth is. $1 million charity bet. Buffett style, Warren Buffett that is right now. Uh, Mark will take Bitcoin and Peter Schiff will take gold from today, from five years out. See who wins. Everyone re retweet this and get Peter Schiff to shut up or put the money down. And I committed to Mark Yusko. I will take a piece of that bet. Yes. Absolutely. And of course, I like to give back to charity too. So it's a dream. Let's do it. Peace, Peter Schiff. Put your money where your mouth is. Take a million dollars, stick it down. We'll put it in escrow and we'll see who wins in five years. All right. That's what I like. People who act like psyops when they're not willing to really invest. And I know he doesn't even buy gold for himself. He just sells it and buys those emerging market stocks, which he openly admitted to his nephew. I know that for a fact. Let's go. Deficit time bomb. Why we Bitcoin and why we invest in disruptive assets. This U.S. government, this is from Equinometrics, by the way, and the U.S. government deficit is getting worse. They are spending more money than they make. We, that's what deficit means. These red lines are all the deficits over history. And 
here, <laughs> literally, the last time the US government had a budget surplus was in the 1990s under a guy called Bill Clinton. But now we're at a situation where the monthly deficits keep growing and surplus or, you know, <laughs> once in a 30 year event, if even that. The point is, there will be more money printing to pay off these debts as we go forward. And it is a time bomb. This is why I make these videos. This is why we all need Bitcoin, because it's hard and it'll protect the damage from all this money printing from all these deficits, which are just getting out of control. Now, I thought this would be super interesting as well. Now, if, if you divide the amount that the US government owes its creditors, that's 538 million Bitcoin, all right? There'll never be more than 15 million Bitcoin. The US government owes 538 million Bitcoin. So you can construe that two ways. One, it owes a lot. <laughs> Number two, Bitcoin's a very small asset. Either way, you win when you get a piece, all right? The other thing is the US government is adding an equivalent of 21 million Bitcoin to its debt every month at this rate. Think about that. $1.06 trillion every month. It's insane. <laughs> Absolutely bonkers. Uh, and this just out as well. Uh, 0 0.1 trillion in new aid was just passed by the House for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. So they call it aid. Um, some people call it funding wars. I don't know what you want to call it. But either way, it's debt. And it's 0 0.1 trillion added onto the tab. And that's why we Bitcoin, okay? I'm not saying aid is good or bad, but I don't like wars, that's for sure. Now, speaking of wars, let's talk about transaction wars in crypto. This is a cool little chart. Shout out to Sanjay as well for sharing from CryptoRank.io. And you can see this is Q1 2024 data fresh off the press. The top 15 blockchains. You will notice as well, some blockchains aren't even on here. They begin with C. But that's all I will say. You'll figure it out for yourselves. But again, this is what I call transaction wars. By far and away, the winner is 2.4 billion transactions is Solana. And Solana was congested for part of this time. Uh, next in the box is Tron, 446 million. And then Near Protocol, 402 million. And then Binance, 382 million. And then you go all, down the, all the way down the line. And I saw a say on there, 366 million. So I decided to dig a little bit into that and compare Sol to say, because a lot of people are saying, oh, say, say, sui, all these, <laughs> even the logos look the same. It's kind of bizarre. So we'll get to that right now. Here is just a snapshot of some of the data we have in our SCP profiler. And this is extremely valuable. So if we look at, say, let's look at uh, users first. Say has six thousand daily active users sui has sixteen thousand and sol has 1.2 million fees sol does about 1.134 1.15 million sometimes 1.2 million in fees 300 dollars believe it or not that's 314 dollars for say and about 8500 for sui they're not going to make it on those fees uh repos for the development side 52,000 for sol 147 for say and 2000 for sui now when you look at things like repositories you can't do a lot when you have so few there's not a lot of breath of daps and that's the easy way to construe that daily transactions 18 and a half million versus 4 million for say and 1.6 million for sui so it's kind of interesting to compare so are these the soul killers i've said many times before no they're not are they adopted? No, they are not. And that's all you need to know. Okay, so be careful what you hear out there. And from Mert, friend of the channel, DeFi will ultimately live on integrated L1s. Why? Latency, atomic composability, and speed. I've always spoken about speed being so, so important. And there were people three years ago that said, no, 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 no. Speed is not important. Yes, it is very important. Even the fastest chain gets congested because it doesn't have enough speed, but it'll be getting there. Anyway, Solana DeFi has made a big comeback, flipping ETH in volume in many times, DEX volume, NFT volume, etc., etc. So 
Let's talk about the transaction champion. It is still Solana. That's why we talk about it a lot. And again, the minute that changes, you know, I always say tap dancing shoes. The minute there is a new best chain, I'll be all over it like white on rice. Believe me, that's what we do here. We swap. We chase alpha. We don't care in what form it comes. And we have no loyalty other than to winners. Now, uh, DeFi Summer. This is a super interesting chart from Dune. And some of you may remember the summer of 2020, the world of crypto witnessed a phenomenon that would later be dubbed DeFi Summer. And then, back then, DeFi Summer was exclusively associated with Ethereum and its EVM forks. And there are lots of them. But in the past two years, the space is now dominated by Solana, Cosmos, Aptos is doing a little bit too. And this is the new paradigm of interoperability and better, faster chains. And also a massive amount of DeFi is happening right now, far more than in the past. So exciting time. And another beneficiary of that is Uniswap. Uniswap actually just went a little bit cross chain and the Uniswapper is 5 x by moving to base, which is the proprietary layer two on from Coinbase and Optimism. Last April, they had about 202,000 uh, monthly swappers. Now it's over a million. So that is extremely good for Uniswap. And it shows you the power of being cross-chain capable. And then let the users decide where they want to go. And they will, of course, always gravitate to the best, cheapest, fastest, and most secure solution, whatever that may be. Now let's talk about Tesla news for a second. We know it's been an extremely bad year for Tesla. Sometimes when it rains, it pours. But here uh, we have the earnings coming out next week. And they did have not a sharp miss in production of cars, but selling them they did because they were focused much more on bundling FSD and FSD trials in with the vehicles. And that delayed maybe a lot of sales, but that was not the priority. And anyway, Q1 is always weak and every car company got smashed in Q1. The question is, is it priced in for next week or will we get a dip? I don't know. We'll see. There are a couple of things that, that I believe could save the day. These are kind of like, um, how do you call them? Uh, Easter eggs. <laughs> Easter eggs. We're looking for a couple of Easter eggs in this Easter season in earnings. So one, uh, energy storage could be a wild card. They might be able to realize some revenue from things that they have deployed. Uh, cost reduction measures. We know there will be some big expenses in Q1 for some of the HR riff that they've done, but that should carry through to being a benefit in the future. Normally, by the way, when stocks have a 10% riff, they go up. Not Tesla. No, because of course, Elon is not a very popular guy out there amongst many people. And then better than expected Q1 delivery production numbers after a week Q1 start. So maybe they'll come out with a surprise like, oh, Cybertruck, we're doing this many now and the margins are very high, etc. And then positive cash flow, very important uh, flow guidance despite huge cash burn. They bought literally every H100 they could possibly buy from NVIDIA and they're building their own silicon and they're building their own data centers and they're investing in robots and FSD and everything else. It is, it's, <laughs> you know, the old expression is markets can be irrational longer than you can stay liquid, but I don't mind. I continue to uh, stack this puppy, even though right now in full disclosure, Tesla represents about 15% of my portfolio because everything else has kind of gone up. This has been a bit stagnant. But I do plan on allocating a lot more and getting it back up for the time it does rebound. I don't know when it's going to rebound. Is it going to be next quarter or 2025? I don't know. Somewhere in between there because they have so many tailwinds. It's crazy. This is now from Elon Musk today. The best selling car on earth is the Model Y. It used to be a $50,000 plus car, $55,000. Now in the US, you can buy it for $29,490 after the tax credit, if you earn under, I think, $400,000 a year. You can buy the best car on the planet for under 30000 and it drives itself for 100 bucks a month. And then people are worried. It's like, oh, but they're pushing these cars, and they're not making a lot of margin on them. Remember, 
the take rate for FSD will probably be north of 30 to 50 percent. Every vehicle will generate $100 plus, soon to be probably 200 bucks again like normal, every month like clockwork. Pure margin. This is what people have not factored into. That's why they want to push it out. Anyway, we'll see. Earnings next week. We've got some big ones. A couple of names I'm interested in. Visa, Tesla, Enphase, uh, all on the same day on Tuesday. And then we have Meta on, and Google on Wednesday. And then Thursday, Microsoft. What else am I missing? Intel's there if people care. Uh, didn't mean for that to rhyme. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, let's check out other news that happened last week too. NVIDIA tanked 15%. Massive. Billions of dollars lost in a very short window of time. And uh, the question is, that it was about 890 bucks. It fell down to 760 a share. And maybe it was a weird kind of double top, which sometimes happens. And the Nasdaq also had a lot of concerns as well about the jawboning of the Fed. No cut in interest rates coming for maybe another while. Um, maybe the AI revolution is over. No, it's just markets. Markets are very rattled about the Middle East interest rates, cuts. But the money spending is happening. You just don't see it in your pocket yet. Thank you so much for coming. Happy Saturday. Quick one today. Uh, it's been a busy, busy, busy week. And now I need to go prepare for the Q&A tomorrow. So I'll see you all tomorrow. Super, super interesting one as well. More face-offs. And thank you as well, Charles, for coming. Thank you to the mods in the chat. I'll see you all tomorrow. Have a good night.